Hello everyone. Welcome to the next lecture in our physiology video lecture series. This lecture is titled circulation. In this particular lecture, we will go through the basics of circulation, learn about different compartments present in our blood, as well as different blood vessels that help blood flow from our heart to different parts of our body. So let us get started. First of all, we have an overview of the whole process of circulation. As we can see in this particular simplified diagram, we have the heart as well as all the other blood vessels shown uh, as a schematic right here. The function, of the, uh, the function of circulation is to service needs of the body tissue, to transport nutrients to the body tissues and to transport waste products away from these body tissues to proper places where they can be excreted. To conduct hormones from one part of the body to another, and in general, maintain an appropriate environment in all tissue fluids of the body for optimal survival and function of the cells. So uh, the, over, the essential function of the circulation is to maintain the process of homeostasis, that is maintenance of the internal environment of the body and make sure that the nutrients are getting transported to uh, the tissues where they are needed and the various products of uh, the various end products of various metabolic reactions are being excreted properly. In this schematic, as we can see right here, these parts show the various tissues of the body and the vessels have been highlighted. The red is obviously oxygenated blood com uh, coming from the left ventricle and the, uh, the bluer blood is essentially the deoxygenated blood that is going back to the right atria. So, the circulation is essentially divided into two parts. First is the pulmonary circulation, in which the uh, in which the right ventricle pumps blood, deoxygenated blood, into the lungs, where they become oxygenated, which is received by the left atria, and hence and henceforth pumped by the left ventricle uh, back through the whole body. The circulation via the lung is uh, known as pulmonary circulation and the circulation from the left ventricle throughout the whole body and then back to the right atria is known as the systemic or peripheral or greater circulation. So uh, if there, has, there is some uh, confusion about what parts of the heart to what, I would like to refer back to the previous video on the heart as that will help clear out all the confusion. But essentially to summarize here, the heart pumps blood into two different circulation parts. First is the circulation via the lung, where deoxygenated blood is oxygenated, uh, which is known as pulmonary circulation. And next is the circulation by the, is the secondary or greater circulation in which part of the heart or, or the left ventricle pumps oxygenated blood throughout the whole body which uh, from which oxygen is utilized by the tissues and deoxygenated blood is deposited back into the heart. So two kinds of circulation. Next, we move on to the functional parts of circulation or essentially what, uh, uh, are what essential parts are required for circulation to happen. The first and foremost are the arteries, which are very muscular. Uh, and carry blood at high pressure and velocity, and these carry uh, most. Uh, these mostly carry the oxygenated blood that is going away from the heart. Next, art, we come to the arterioles. Arterioles are the last branch of the arterial system. So after the major arteries such as the aorta take the oxygenated blood from the directly from the heart, they bifur they differentiate and bifurcate into smaller and smaller parts uh, when uh, till they reach the tissue level. These smaller branches are known as the arterioles and are the last branch of the arterial system. And these control blood flow into the capillaries. Capillaries are the smallest vessels through which blood pass. And these, help, uh, these are the places where uh, the exchange of fluids, nutrients, and electrolytes between blood and the interstitial fluid essentially happens. So this part of the circulatory system is where the nutrients uh, uh, reach the particular tissues and the excretory products, so the end products such as carbon dioxide, are released back into the blood. Next, the uh, capillaries join together to form the venules, which collect blood from the capillaries 
and uh, join together to finally form the veins. The veins are large, very larger blood vessels which transfer blood back to the heart and act as a major reservoir for blood. Uh, compared to the arteries, the veins are very less muscular and the blood flow uh, through the veins is uh, not pulsatile in nature. That is, it is not affected by the pulsing nature of the heart. And blood flows smoothly uh, in the veins themselves. They also act as a major reservoir of the blood. What uh, that means is that uh, if we go back to the schematic right here, the arteries hold uh, around 30% of the blood the whole time the circulation is going on. Whereas the veins and venules essentially hold 64% of the blood. So veins are the major reservoir of the blood that is present in circulation. So that was all about arteries and veins. Uh, we move on to the next part, which is uh, in which we look into the normal blood pressure in different portions of the circulatory system in a resting portion. So one thing you have to understand is that flow of blood is intricately related to the blood pressure, uh, blood pressure that is exerted by the heart. If we look directly uh, at the uh, arteries, especially the iota, which is connected to the left ventricle, if we concentrate on the iota, we will be able to understand that the blood flowing through the iota has uh, by, is pulsatile in nature. That is, the blood pressure move, uh, rises. Uh, close to 120 millimeters per mer of mercury and falls down to around 80. And this happens throughout the iota. But the, this is essentially because the blood is flowing directly from the heart, uh, traveling at these pressures, and it is not yet uh, it is not yet smoothened out for circulation throughout the whole body. For, uh, and we can see that uh, in the larger arteries and the small arteries as well, this pulsatile nature of blood pressure continues. This obviously is uh, due to the systole and diastole of the heart till we reach the level of uh, arteries where the highly muscular iota, uh, highly muscular arteries have been able to slowly reduce the blood pressure and bring it down to a nominal level. Which, and we see at the capillary level, their pressure is, uh, there is no pulsatile nature of the blood pressure has gone down completely and we have a smooth curve. And finally, in case of the larger wheels, we ha again have no blood pressure at all. So essentially, the blood is flowing at zero millimeters of mercury. Again, we come back to the pulmonary arteries where there is pulsatile nature because this blood is directly flowing from the heart to the lungs. But here in this case, the, uh, the range of blood pressure is very low because in, in the pulmonary circulation, the the in the pulmonary circulation, the blood pressure levels do not vary that much. But again, as we can see, when uh, we reach to the pulmonary veins, the blood pressure has again smoothened out to a level that uh, to a very low level. So what this uh, slide tells us is that when blood enters the larger arteries, there is a uh, pulsatile nature in the pressure of the blood, which is a slowly and slowly smoothened out due to the muscular nature of the arteries which absorb the pulsatile nature and generate a smoothly flow, smooth blood flow which reaches the capillaries where essentially the uh, exchange of nutrients occurs and finally when they have find, uh, finally when they have reached the larger veins the pulsatile nature as well as blood pressure essentially dies down to a very low level close to zero millimeters of water. So next, uh, we move on to the basic theory of circulation. The basic theory of circulation uh, function is as follows. The first point uh, tells us that the rate of blood flow to each tissue of the blood is almost always precisely controlled in relation to the tissue need. So what this means is that a particular uh, the rate of blood that will flow uh, the rate at which the blood will flow through a particular tissue will entirely depend on the need of the tissue, if it needs oxygen or other nutrients at that moment or not. The rate of blood flow is not a global thing that is controlled at a higher level, but at the tissue level itself. Next, the cardiac output is controlled mainly by the sum of all local tissue flows. So this essentially uh, goes back to the stalling mechanism that we have already talked about that the 
amount of blood that is pumped out of the heart is directly related to the amount of blood that is received by the heart. So, uh, uh, the cardiac output is controlled by the sum of all the local tissue flows that goes back into the heart. And finally, in general, the arterial pressure is controlled independently of either local blood uh, flow control or cardiac output control. So, what this means is that the arterial pressure that is ex uh, that is maintained by the heart, which is normally 120 millimeters of mercury divided by 80 millimeters of mercury uh, with respect to systole and diastole, is uh, independently maintained irrespective of what the need at the tissue level is or what the cardiac output is. So these are the points of the, the these are the way, uh, basic theory of circulation. Thus, uh, when uh, thus all these points essentially deliver that uh, when tissues are active, nutrients uh, the nut nutrient requirement or uh, when tissues are active, the nutrient need can occasionally be uh, much greater than uh, the normal resting uh, resting level, rising as much as twenty to thirty times. Yes, uh, yet the heart normally cannot increase its cardiac output more than four to seven times greater than the resting level. Thus, it is not possible to increase the blood flow globally to match the need of the particular tissue. So this goes back to, uh, to the first point itself. However, the microvessels can monitor and lower the local oxygen nutrient and dilate or constrict in order to change the local blood. So the tissue level control is not maintained by the heart or the cardiac output, but the microvessels, that is the capillaries and the arterioles, maintain how much blood will flow into a particular tissue and thus maintain the local blood flow. Also, the nervous control of the circulation from the central nervous system provides additional help in controlling tissue blood flow. This, uh, yeah, this is essentially what the first point uh, describes to us. That the rate of blood flow is not maintained globally, but the local tissues and the local microvessels can control the flow of blood that needs to flow into a particular tissue. Next, the second point that the cardiac output is controlled mainly by the sum of local tissue flows uh, is because when blood flows through a tissue, it immediately returns by way of veins to the heart. The heart responds automatically to this increased inflow of blood by pumping it immediately into the arteries from whence it had originally come. That is the stalling mechanism that we have already talked about in the previous video. Thus, the heart acts as an automaton responding to the demands of the tissue. The heart, however, often uh, needs help in the form of special nerve signals to make it pump the required amount of blood. These are the sympathetic nerve system uh, the, these are the sympathetic nerve, nerves that innervate the heart and can uh, affect the amount of blood that uh, the heart pumps up or the cardiac output. And finally, uh, the arterial pressure is also maintained by, by the nervous system via a special uh, sense, uh, uh, via special sense organoids known as baroreceptors which maintain the arterial pressure and increase or decrease the blood pressure if uh, the arterial blood pressure fluctuates a lot. This is maintained by maintaining the cardiac output as well as the uh, contraction of the arterial, uh, arterial muscular walls. So this essentially completes the basic theory of uh, circulatory function. Next, we move on to blood flow uh, and how is blood flow determined via various factors. Blood flow is essentially determined via pressure difference, uh, which uh, is exerted on either end of a blood vessel, which provides the force needed for blood to flow and is directly proportional to the flow of blood, which is obvious that the amount, uh, the rate at which blood will flow is directly proportional to the pressure gradient or the force applied on the blood to flow through it. Next is vascular resistance. Uh, which is a result of the friction between blood and the vessel endothelium uh, and this is uh, inversely proportional to the blood. Combining both pressure and uh, pressure difference and vascular resistance gives us the Ohm's law in which flow is equal to, uh, is equal to the uh, 
difference between uh, the pressure gradient divided by the vascular resistance uh, encountered by the blood, which is F equal to del P by R. This is a, a handy uh, formula for us to determine the blood flow, which uh, occurs between two ends of a blood vessel. Next, we move on to the characteristics of blood. In a normal, uh, uh, normal vessel, the flow of blood is laminar or streamlined. And the velocity of flow is greater in the middle than the edges, so that the middle portion extends a bit further than the uh, large portion of the blood flow. And thus, uh, we observe a parabolic velocity profile. So essentially, the flow of blood forms a parabola right here. But there can be cases in which uh, there is turbulent flow of blood. This occurs essentially uh, when uh, this occurs essentially in case of the great veins which uh, travel throughout our torso and deposit blood right into our heart. And uh, because these veins flow through a very sharp angle right at the neck. If, uh, the, if the flow of blood is very uh, fast, then the vein may collapse and create a tendency for turbulent flow, which can be shown right here. In turbulent flow, the blood does not flow exactly in one direction in the parabolic nature, but instead bounces around, and uh, which can create some problems for the flow of blood. This essentially occurs when a uh, vein collapses. So what exactly judges the uh, if a flow of blood or any fluid is turbulent or streamlined? The tendency of turbulent flow is uh, given by the Reynolds number. If the Reynolds number is less than 400, uh, we can say that the flow of blood or any other fluid is laminar. Whereas if it is greater than 2000, it is turbulent. Reynolds number is uh, given by the formula right here which is Re equal to dB rho by eta, where uh, D is the diameter of the blood vessel, rho is the density, V is the velocity of blood flow, and e, to, e is the viscosity of blood. The flow of blood is uh, measured by uh, devices which, is, uh, which are known as flow meters, and there are two types. One is the electromagnetic flow meter, and the second is the ultrasonic Doppler flow meter. So this was uh, about the characteristics of blood flow. Next, we move on to Poiseuille's law and the effect of sympathetic nervous system on blood flow. So uh, what does Poiseuille's law say? Poiseuille's law says that the conductance or the rate at which blood will flow uh, is directly proportional to the fourth power of diameter of the blood vessel. So uh, what this means is that if a blood vessel has a diameter of one millimeter, then the blood which is flowing, say, is flowing at a rate of one milliliter per minute. But at the, keeping the pressure constant, if the diameter is doubled, then the rate of blood flow is uh, increases within the order or in the fourth power. That is, the flow now becomes 16 milliliter per minute. That is two to the power four. Similarly, if the diameter is, uh, is increased by four times, then the flow also increases to the uh, at the power of by the power of four and becomes two hundred and fifty six milliliter per minute. Thus, essentially, the rate of blood flow between a small vessel and a large vessel is very large. So, a very small manipulation in the diameter of a vessel can affect the blood flow by a lot. This comes into play by uh, this will come into play as we go on and look into vascular distensibility and compliance. Next, we also observe the effect of the sympathetic nervous system on the flow of blood. As we have already known that a sympathetic nervous system uh, can affect the rate at which the heart beats as well as the cardiac output. And thus, when there is sympathetic stimulation, as we can see right here by the green curve, the arterial pressure at which blood flows can increase by a lot. And whereas in case of sympathetic inhibition, the uh, arterial blood pressure can drop and, uh, to nearly zero. Thus, uh, this is uh, also a mechanism by which the nervous system can control the rate of blood flow by 
affecting the arterial pressure directly. Next, uh, we move on to vascular distensibility and compliance. A valuable characteristics of vascular system is that all blood vessels are distensible. That is, they can change their volume. When the pressure in blood is increased, increased, this dilates the blood vessels and therefore decreases their resistance. That's what essentially occurs is that we can as imagine a balloon right here. When the pressure in the blood increases, uh, we can imagine that we are uh, blowing air right into a balloon. So the uh, volume of the blood vessels increases as well. And as we have just seen that if the volume increases, then uh, then the uh, if the volume increases, then the conductance also increases dramatically with it. And uh, as we know that conductance is inverse proportional to the resistance of anything, so resistance also decreases. So what essentially occurs is that in case blood pressure increases, the uh, vessel walls are distensible, so their volume increases. The volume increase essentially dramatically increases the conductance and conductance is inversely proportional to the resistance and thus resistance of the blood flow decreases. The distensible nature of the arteries allows them to accommodate the pulsatile nature of blood flow and uh, allows veins to store large amounts of blood. Arteries are eight times less distensible than the veins. This is mainly due to the muscular coating that surrounds the veins, uh, the arteries themselves. And uh, vascular distensibility can be expressed as the fractional increase in volume for each millimeter rise of mercury with the formula vascular distensibility equals to increase in volume divided by original volume upon increase in pressure. And that is fraction of increase in volume divided by the original uh, divided by increase in pressure. Another uh, important quantity is the uh, vascular compliance. Vascular compliance of the blood vessel tree is the quantity of blood stored in a given portion of the circulation for each millimeter of mercury uh, pressure rise. So this is a quantity that can be more easily determined than vascular distensibility and is also very useful. Vascular compliance is given by the formula vascular compliance equal to the increase in volume divided by increase in pressure in a particular blood vessel. So this, can, this gives us exactly how compliant or how much a blood vessel can increase its volume with respect to increasing blood pressure. Now we move on to the volume pressure curves of the systemic arterial and venous systems, which show the, uh, uh, the effect of the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system can also uh, control the uh, the sympathetic uh, nervous system, as we have seen, can control the pressure, uh, the blood pressure, by controlling the heart directly, the cardiac output from the heart directly, and this in turn can affect the compliance and the volume of blood that is held in the particular vessels. So, in case of the venous system that is shown in blue here, in case there is systemic uh, the sympathetic stimulation then uh, the blood pressure obviously will increase as we have just seen in the previous plot. And uh, hence, uh, with respect to that, the amount of volume of blood that is held by in the venous system also increases. Similarly, in case of a uh, sympathetic inhibition, the blood pressure decreases and thus the volume of blood held by the venous system also decreases. A similar trend is also seen in the case of the arterial system, in which in the red uh, marked arterial system, Sympathetic stimulation, sympathetic stimulation decreases the volume of blood held, and sympathetic inhibition increases the volume of blood held by the arterial system. So uh, this also points to the fact that the, when blood pressure increases. When the, the blood pressure is affected, we can also see the a second point that occurs between the arterial and the venous system, that the if uh, the change in the volume uh, held by the venous system uh, is a lot. So, as you can see, the slope of the venous system 
lines are very much larger than that of the arcuate system lines. This tells us that in case of the venous, the venous system is very much more compliant by the than the arcuate system, as the net change in pressure introduces a lot of change in the amount of uh, in the volume of blood held. So essentially, at uh, twenty milliliter mercury, the uh, in case there is sympathetic stimulation. Blood held is around three thousand millimeter uh, milliliter, whereas uh, in case of sympathetic inhibition, it is around three thousand five hundred. Whereas the same thing for arterial uh, system, uh, when there is uh, sympathetic stimulation, is around four hundred uh, milliliters of volume of blood, with respect to around five hundred milliliters of volume of blood. So the arterial system tree is very less uh, com uh, compliant than the ven uh, venous system and is. Much less affected by the system uh, than the volume of blood held in the arterial system is much less affected by sympathetic stimulation. Next, uh, we move on to the arterial uh, pressure pulsations that we have uh, seen a bit uh, just a uh, bit before. So uh, it's, uh, this is essentially the same thing. So with each beat of the heart, a new surge of blood fills the arteries. If the arteries were not distensible. All of this new blood would have flown uh, through the peripheral blood vessels almost instantaneously. Only during the cardiac systole, and no blood will have flown through uh, during the uh, diastole. So this uh, systole is the phase during which the heart ejects blood into the arteries, and diastole is when uh, the heart rests and allows blood to be filled into it. So. But if uh, the arteries were not distensible, only during the cardiac systole, when blood is ejected from the heart, the blood would have flown through the body, and during diastole, no blood would have flown at all. But this is not the case. Compliance of the arterial tree reduces the pressure pulsations to almost no pulsations by the time blood reaches the capillaries. Tissue blood flow is mainly continuous. So as you can see in this graph, that in case of proximal aorta. We have a, a increase in blood pressure during systole and a huge decrease in blood pressure during the diastole, uh, and this also is uh, relevant to the blood flow, uh, blood flow through the aorta as well. So in systole, a large amount of blood flows through the aorta, whereas in uh, diastole, the blood volume drops down to almost zero. But if we see in the case of I, uh, the arterioles and the capillaries, the blood flow is almost constant. And thus, uh, the pulsatile nature of blood flow that is seen in proximal aorta is not reflected back in the capillaries themselves. And as capillaries are the point at which the, all the exchange of nutrients occurs, the blood, uh, the tissue blood flow through the capillaries is not affected at all. And thus, the microcirculation or the uh, essential part where the nutrients will get exchanged is not affected. By the pulsatile nature of the heart pumping, due to the distensible nature of the arteries, the two factors which affect the pulse uh, pressure is the stroke volume output of the blood, which is the uh, amount of uh, stroke volume uh, output of the blood is a fraction of blood. The uh, stroke volume output of the blood is the uh, amount of blood that is ejected from the heart during the systole, and the vascular compliance. Of the arterial tree, uh, that uh, is just uh, the two factors that we have seen: the compliance and the distensibility. That is how much blood they can uh, accommodate within themselves with respect to change in pressure. Next, we move on to veins and their functions. So, uh, blood from all systemic veins flow into the right atrium of the heart, which is known as the central venous pressure. The right atrial pressure is regulated by a balance between the ability of the heart to pump out blood from the right atrium into the ventricles, into the lungs, and the tendency of the blood to flow from the peripheral veins into the right atrium. Normally, the right atrial pressure is around zero millimeters of mercury. So, uh, at the level of the heart, we have around zero millimeters of mercury right here. So, uh, what are the effects of uh, venous uh, intra-abdominal pressure on venous pressure of the leg? As we can see, that uh, the 
by blood must flow from the veins uh, in the legs as uh, right into the right atrium uh, right atrium of the heart and the intra abdominal pressure that is the pressure uh, exerted by the intra abdominal cavity right in the middle can affect the blood flow from the legs right back into the heart the pressure in the abdominal cavity of a recumbent person normally averages around 6 mm mercury but this can rise to around 15 to 13 mm of mercury as a result of pregnancy large tumors or excessive fluid storage in the intra abdominal space the pressure in the veins of the legs must rise above this abdominal pressure before abdominal veins uh, abdominal veins will open and allow blood flow from the legs to the heart so what does this mean uh, what this means is that if the pressure uh, at the uh, obviously blood will flow from a higher uh, pressure to a lower pressure the pressure at uh, the uh, right atria is around 0 mm mercury if the pressure uh, blood pressure at the legs is not higher than the intra abdominal pressure then blood cannot flow from the legs back to the heart and will be stored right in the legs which is very dangerous thus uh, this can only occur in case of uh, disabilities such as uh, large tumors or excessive fluid storage or can also occur in the case of pregnancies where uh, intraabdominal pressure rises to a higher degree which prevents blood flow and collapses the abdominal veins the gravitational pressure also uh, has an effect on venous pressure in different parts of our body when the person is standing the pressure in the right atrium remains absolutely uh, remains around 0 mm mercury in uh, an adult who is standing absolutely still the pressure of the veins is about 90 mm mercury simply because of the gravitational weight of the blood in the veins so the blood present in the venous uh, venous tree also uh, has a weight that is exerted as blood uh, we uh, go down the venous tree to the legs themselves at this point uh, the lowest point in the uh, in the venous tree we will see that the blood high, high the blood o above that uh, those weights exert their own weight on the blood below them and thus these veins will have a huge pressure of around 90 mm mercury if a person is standing absolutely still uh, this is only due to the uh, this only due to the presence of gravity and can be debilitating if not were removed by any uh, force other the any force that is generated in the body so uh, how is this gravitational pressure uh, removed by the body itself so this is done by the help of venous valves and uh, venous pumps there are valves present at regular junctions in the veins if there were well, no valves in the veins the gravitational pressure effect would have caused the venous pressure in feet to always be around 90 mm mercury. However, every time one moves a leg, one tightens a muscle, uh, tightens the muscles due to the movement, and this compresses the veins in or adjacent to the muscles, and this squeezes blood out of the veins. So one part of the veins get uh, squeezed, and this causes blood to flow into another part of the veins. Direction of blood flow is determined of the, uh, by the valves which open towards the heart. So these uh, veins, uh, the pumps are unidirectional in nature. That is, they will only open in one direction. And when the muscle uh, is, uh, squeezes the veins, the blood can only flow towards the heart. This pumping system is known as the venous pump or the muscle pump. And it is efficient enough that under ordinary circumstances, the venous pressure in the feet of a walking adult is less than 20 millimeters mercury. And thus, this is how the excessive pressure in the uh, lower leg, uh, in the venous tree of the lower leg, is reduced. But these, uh, this system can become incompetent. Valves of the venous system can become incompetent by overstretching due to excessive venous pressure. Pre the, uh, if the pressure increases a lot, then uh, this will cause a uh, this will cause a failure of the whole venous pump. In case the venous pump uh, uh, actually 
is uh, destroyed, the person develops varicose veins, which are characterized by large bulbous uh, protrusions of the veins beneath the skin of the entire leg, particularly the lower leg. This is evident in people who stand uh, uh, who stand on their legs the whole day a lot, and also in case of preg uh, pregnant females who have to stand a lot, which uh, all of which contribute to increasing pressure in their legs and creation of these varicose veins. A person with uh, these varicose veins does not have a uh, correctly functioning uh, venous pump, and the blood pressure in their feet are always very high. That is, which is around about the my plus 90 millimeters per mercury, millimeters of mercury level. Next, we move on to other functions of the veins, which uh, include veins uh, functioning as a reservoir of the blood. More than 60% of all blood in circulatory system is usually in the veins. The spleen, which sometimes can decrease in size sufficiently to release 100 millimeters of blood into other areas of circulation. Further, the liver, it's the sinuses of which can release several hundred millimeters of blood into the remainder of the circulation. Large abdominal veins can store as much as 300 millimeters of blood. And the venous plexus beneath the skin can, can also contribute several hundred millimeters of blood. So if there is an injury that causes decrease in blood anywhere in the uh, system, these uh, sources can be used in order to replenish it. The heart and the lungs, although not directly part of the uh, circulatory system, can also be considered as uh, reservoirs of blood as the heart, while, burn, uh, while in the diastolic stage, stores a lot of blood, as well as the lungs have different uh, the uh, lungs also uh, contains different uh, small vesicles in which blood gas stored the spleen also acts further as a reservoir of rbcs the spleen uh, has two separate areas the venous sinus and the pulp the sinus can swell to the same size uh, swell the same as the other parts of the venous system and store whole blood in this uh, Clinic pulp, the capillaries are so permeable that whole blood, including red blood cells, oozes through the capillary walls into a trabecular mesh forming the red pulp, which is right here. The red cells are trapped in the trabeculae while the plasma flows on into the venous sinuses and then into the general circulation. As a result, red pulp of the uh, spleen is a special reservoir that contains large quantities of concentrated red blood cells which are released into the blood when there is a need for them. Otherwise, they can be stored in the spleen. Next, we move on to the microcirculation. The most purposeful uh, function of the circulation occurs in microcirculation. This is the transport of nutrients to the tissues and removal of cell excreta. Microcirculation occurs uh, at the smallest level, that is at the level of capillaries, arterioles, and venules. In general, uh, so we will first look into the function of arterioles and venules. In general, each nutrient artery entering an organ branches six to eight times before the arteries become small enough to be called arterioles, which have an internal diameter of only 10 to 15 micrometers. Then the arterioles themselves branch two to five times to reach a diameter of five to nine micrometers at their ends where they supply blood to the capillaries. The arterioles themselves are highly muscular and their diameters can change many fold. The meta arterioles or the terminal arterioles do not have a continuous muscular port, but the smooth muscle fiber encircles the vessel at intermittent points. At the point where each true capillary orgi originates from a meta arteriole, a smooth muscle fiber usually encircles the capillary. This is known as the precapillary sphincter. The venules, uh, the uh, precapillary sphincter is essentially the last muscular port that can control the flow of blood into the capillary. The venules are larger than the arterioles and have a much weaker muscular port. Next, we move on to the capillaries. 
the uh, capillary wall is composed of unicellular layer of endothelial cells and is surrounded by a very thin basement membrane on the outside of the capillary so here we have the basement membrane and these are the endothelial cells this is a, a entire a entire cell which are divided with uh, by the intercellular cleft between them the total thickness of the capillary wall is up only about 0.5 micrometer the internal diameter of the capillary is 4 to 9 micrometer barely large enough for a red blood cell and other blood cells to squeeze through fluid can percolate freely, freely through the intercellular cleft present in the capillary walls the cleft uh, or pore normally has a uniform spacing with a width of 6 to 7 nanometers and allows water soluble ions and small solutes to easily diffuse through it into the interstitial, interstitial space while preventing larger macromolecules Next, we move on to vasomotion and exchange between blood and interstitial fluid. Blood uh, flows intermittently through the capillaries, turning on and off every few seconds or minutes. This turning on and off, as we have just uh, uh, looked into, depends on the need of the particular tissue. The cause of the intermittency is known as vasomotion, which occurs due to intermittent contraction of the meta arterioles and precapillary sphincters. Thus, if the precapillary sphincter is closed, blood cannot flow into the capillary and thus uh, the blood flow is turned off. But in case it is open, the blood can easily flow into the capillary and the blood flow is turned off. Vasomotion is regulated by concentration of oxygen in the tissue. Less oxygen supply means more blood flow and vice versa. So if a tissue is uh, a very active and utilizing oxygen at a very high rate, then the blood capillaries will have a low oxygen content. This low oxygen content will trigger flow of blood into the uh, tissue uh, into the tissue capillary, uh, from which uh, so that the tissue can function at a high level. But in case the tissue is inactive and is unable to uh, utilize all the oxygen and the nutrients present in the particular capillary, then uh, the blood flow is reduced so that no uh, no nutrients and oxygen is wasted on an inactive tissue. And thus, uh, we see, uh, we go back to the basic circulation theory that the flow of blood is determined by the tissue need itself. Next, we move on to the exchange, what kind of exchange uh, of substances to capillary walls that can, uh, can occur. The most important means by which substances are transferred between plasma and interstitial fluid is diffusion. Lipid soluble substances can easily diffuse directly through the cell membrane of the, end, the capillary endothelium, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide. They do not need to look for intercellular clefts and can rightly diffuse right through the cells themselves. Water-soluble, non-lipid soluble substances diffuses only through the intercellular pores or clefts in the capillary membrane. For example, sodium ions and glucose. High molecular size in decreases the diffusion rate because they can essentially pass through the pore size of the intercellular clefts. The concentration gradient obviously will increase the rate of diffusion. And uh, another point to note is the water molecules diffuse transversely. That is uh, the uh, trans uh, diffusion uh, from the capillary to the interstitial fluid at a rate 80 times greater than the rate of blood flow across the capillary. So a huge rate at which uh, diffusion can occur uh, through the capillaries themselves. And next, we have a table in which we look at the relative permeability of skeletal muscle capillary pores to different size molecules. So essentially, uh, we compare the molecular weight to the permeability of uh, the permeability through the capillary pores. In this particular table, uh, the rate of uh, permeability of water is, is taken as one and as we see and move down through the table itself we see that as the molecular weight of the particular solute increases say uh, glucose which has a molecular weight of around 180 the permeability has already dropped down to 60 percent and as we move on to larger proteins such as hemoglobin and albumin the permeability has dropped down hugely uh, to about 1% and 0.1% respectively. So molecular weight is an essential player that determines the permeability of a substance as it uh, diffuses through the capillaries. 
Next, we move on to the interstitial fluid and the interstitial. About one sixth of the total fluid of the body consists of spaces between cells, which are collectively known as the interstitial. The fluid in these spaces is the interstitial fluid. The interstitium contains two major types of solid structures, collagen fiber bundles and proteoglycan filaments. So collagen uh, is a particular uh, a collagen is a particular by polymer of glucose, which is present in the interstitium and proteoglycans are essentially uh, large polymers of uh, sugar molecules, which have protein moieties attached to them. The collagen fiber bundles extend a long distance into the interstitium. They are extremely strong and therefore provide most of the tensional strength of the tissue. The proteoglycans, however, are extremely thinly coiled or twisted molecules composed of about 98% hyaluronic acid, which is a polymer of sugar, which is a carbohydrate or polymer of glucose, and a 2% of protein. The interstitial fluid is entrapped mainly in minute spaces among the proteoglycan filaments, forming a semi solid tissue gel. Fluid diffuses through this gel. Almost all fluid in the interstitium normally is entrapped within the tissue gel and occasionally small rivulets of free fluid and small free fluid vesicles are also present, which means that uh, fluid uh, that is uh, free from the proteoglycan molecules and therefore can uh, flow freely. So uh, most of the fluid is stored in the form of the gel, a uh, semi-solid gel, which cannot move a lot, but uh, there are small rivulets of free fluid that can diffuse around in the whole uh, interstitial fluid. The pressure in the interstitial fluid is slightly negative due to the action of the lymphatic system, which we'll look into the, in just a moment. Next, we move on to uh, fluid filtration across capillaries. The four major uh, hydrostatic and colloid osmotic pressure uh, forces which determine the movement of fluid through the capillary wall are as follows. And the first and foremost is the capillary pressure, which tends to force fluid outward through the capillary membrane. So the pressure of blood in the capillary itself, which, uh, it tends, uh, which pushes you know, fluid and substances out of the capillary. Next is the interstitial fluid pressure which is the pressure exerted by the interstitial fluid, which tends to force fluid inward through the capillary membrane if PIF positive. So the interstitial fluid is positive, then it tries to push interstitial fluid into the capillaries. Whereas uh, if the PIF is negative, the fluid tries to move into the interstitial uh, fluid itself. Well, substances try to move into the interstitial fluid itself. Uh, next is the colloid plasma, uh, is the capillary plasma colloid osmotic pressure, which tend to cause osmosis of fluid inward through the capillary membrane. And uh, finally, is the interstitial uh, fluid uh, colloid osmotic pressure, which tends to cause osmosis of fluid outward through the capillary membrane. So the capillary pressure and the interstitial fluid or uh, colloid osmotic pressure try try to push the substances out of the capillary, whereas the interstitial fluid pressure and the plasma colloid osmotic pressure try to force substances into the capillary. If the sum of these the net force, uh, forces, net filtration pressure is positive, there will be net fluid filtration across the capillaries. If the sum of the Starling forces is negative, there will be net fluid absorption from the interstitial spaces into the capillaries. The net filtration pressure is calculated as NFP equal to PC minus PIF minus IP plus pi IF, which is essentially this uh, schematic given mathematical form. Finally, the rate of capillary fil filtration is determined as uh, filtration equal to KF into NFP. NFP is obviously the net fluid filtration and KF is a constant which uh, is determined the amount of intercellular inter pores and their sizes and different other factors which are relevant to the capillaries themselves. Next, we move on to 
analysis of the forces which cause filtration and reabsorption at the arterial uh, and venous ends. So, uh, on one side we have uh, the FA the uh, various forces calculated with respect to the arterial end of the capillary. And on the other side, we have the various forces uh, calculated with respect to the venous end of the capillary. So if we uh, look into them, first the capillary pressure at the arterial end is around 30 millimeters of mercury. The interstitial fl uh, uh, fluid pressure, which is negative, is around 3. And the interstitial fluid or colloid osmotic pressure is 8. All of this combined to give the total output uh, outward force as 41 millimeters of mercury. On the other hand, forces which tend the fluid inward are the, uh, only the plasma colloid osmotic pressure, which is uh, 28 millimeters of mercury. Thus, we have a net outward force at the arterial end, which is around 13 millimeters of mercury. So, 13 millimeters of mercury pressure is trying to force uh, substances out of the I force the substance out of the capillary itself. Next, uh, we look at the whole uh, analysis of the forces at the venous end. Here we see that the total inward force is still maintained by the plasma colloid osmotic pressure, which is 28 millimeters of mercury, which is constant both ends. The only change is seen in the capillary pressure, which uh, drops down significantly to around 10 millimeters of mercury. The other two forces, the negative interstitial fluid pressure and the uh, interstitial fluid colloid osmotic pressure, remain at their original values to give a final outward force as 21 millimeters of mercury. Thus, now the summation of, every, uh, all, of all the forces gives us a net inward force of 7 millimeters of mercury. Hence, at the arterial end, there is an outward force which tries to push, uh, push substances out of the capillary. Whereas at the venous end, there is an inward force that pushes substances back into the capillary itself. On observing this point, E. H. Starling pointed out uh, that under normal condition, a state of near equilibrium exists in the capillary membrane. That is the fluid that uh, the amount of fluid filtering outward from the uh, arterial end of the capillary equals almost exactly the fluid return to circulation by absorption at the venous end. Next, we move on to the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system uh, represents an accessory route through which fluid can flow through the interstitial spaces into the blood. So this is a parallel route that follows the blood circulation, but is present uh, only in case of major, uh, major blood vessels and passes through the interstitial fluid. Most importantly, the lymphatics can carry pro large proteins and particulate matters away from the tissue spaces, neither of which can be removed uh, by absorption directly into the blood capillaries. So if uh, a large protein is deposited or fallen particle is detected or a cell uh, is, uh, is lysed in the interstitial fluid, it cannot uh, be excreted from the system via the blood capillaries themselves because these large particles can move into the blood flow. But these can act, uh, these, all these substances are removed via the lymphatic system, which can uh, accommodate these large particles. Almost all the tissues uh, of the body have a special lymph channel that, uh, that drains excess fluid directly from interstitial spaces. So this is the lymph uh, network that is uh, shown right here. Essentially, all lymph vessels from the lower part of the body eventually empty into the thoracic duct. About one tenth of the fluid in the circulation enters, enters lymphatic capillaries and returns to blood through the lymphatic system. And the fluid that returns to the circulation by way of lymphatics is extremely important because substances of high molecular weight, such as proteins, cannot be absorbed from the tissues in any other way, although they enter the lymphatic uh, capillaries almost unimpeded. So what is the reason of this uh, lymphatics allowing such a large, uh, such large particles, particles to enter directly into them? At the junction of endo the adjacent endothelial cells of the uh, lymphatic capillaries, the edge of one endothelial cell overlaps with the edge of adjacent cell in such a way, the overlapping edge is free to flap inwards. So essentially a uh, large pore or gate that can be uh, opened by fluid flowing into it. 
there is forming a minute valve that opens to the interior of the lymphatic capillary. Inter interstitial fluid along with its suspended particles can push the valve open and flow directly into the lymphatic capillaries. But uh, this flap, as it is unidirectional, the fluid cannot flow back into the interstitial fluid and thus uh, the lymphatic flow is only in one direction. Next, we look into the effect of interstitial pressure or lymph flow. The rate of lymph flow is 120 millimeter per hour or 2 to 3 liters per day. Normal lymph flow is very little at interstitial fluid pressure, more negative than normal value of minus 6 millimeters of mercury. So as we have just seen that interstitial pressure is slightly negative, but uh, we, if this uh, interstitial pressure rises, uh, interstitial pressure decreases uh, to a more negative value, then lymph flow will all, uh, also decrease. As interstitial pressure rises to 0 millimeters of mercury atmospheric pressure, flow increases more than 24. So, uh, since the lymphatic vessels are uh, carrying away fluid from the interstitial space, there is a slight negative uh, pressure that uh, occurs in the interstitial fluid itself. But in case this negative, uh, negative interstitial fluid pressure rises a lot in the negative direction itself, then lymph flow will obviously decrease because fluid will always try to flow from the uh, from positive uh, pressure to negative pressure. So the fluid will try to flow from the lymph vessel, uh, vessels right into the interstitial fluid and uh, lymph flow itself will stop. But in case interstitial fluid rises, uh, pressure rises, so this uh, interstitial fluid pressure uh, increases, thus the interstitial, uh, this part pressure increases to a higher value then the uh, amount of interstitial, of interstitial fluid which will try to get into the lymph vessel will also increase as fluid will try to flow from a positive higher pressure to a lower pressure in the lymph vessels themselves. And thus, this can increase the lymph flow to around 20. Next, we look into lymphatic pump and lymph flow. A valves exist in all lymph channels. When collecting lymphatic uh, or uh, when collecting a lymphatic or larger lymph vessel becomes stretched with fluid, so uh, a lot of fluid is present here. The smooth muscle wall in the uh, smooth muscle in the wall of the vessel automatically contracts. Each segment of the lymph vessel between successive valve acts as a separate automatic pump. That is, even a slight filling of segment causes it to contract, and fluid is pumped through the next valve into the next lymphatic segment. So uh, this segment uh, it pumps lymph into the next one and this one will then pump it into the next uh, lymphatic segment. And finally, uh, this uh, will uh, subsequently fill up the next segment and a few seconds later that will also contract. And the process will continue along uh, the lymph vessel until the fluid is finally emptied back into the blood circulation. Thus, the rate of lymph flow is determined by the product of interstitial uh, fluid pressure times the activity of this lymphatic pump. So, uh, this was all we had uh, today. Uh, these are the references to the particular uh, slide that we have just discussed. Thank you.